Hi, I'm Hannah, and welcome to New Creation Christian Center. Hi, my name is Precious Franklin, and I'd like to welcome you to New Creation Christian Center. Hi, I'm Pastor Annis Fay, and I want to welcome you to New Creation Christian Center. Hello, this is Pastor Harold Franklin, and I want to welcome you to New Creation's live stream service. And we know during this time of crises that we're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow or today or whatever, but just tune in, listen to what God has to say to you today, and know that he's going to bring us all through this situation. Because God, our God, the only God, he is able yes. to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. So everybody in this place and on live stream, put your hands together. Come on. Do like this.
Because God yeah. holds all the power, all the authority in his hands. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega, the beginning and the end. and say hallelujah.
Hello, my name is Precious Franklin. I'm one of the pastors at New Creation Christian Center. And I want to share this verse with you today. Psalm 46, verse 10. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and exalted in all the earth. Today, I want you to remember to be still and know that he's God. Continue just to give him praise and know that he is in control. Hello, this is Pastor Harold Franklin, and I wanted to just talk to some of you that are going through financially, and they're, you're dealing with maybe your business is slowing down, and things around you, your job has maybe laid you off, but I want to encourage you that don't allow that to dissuade you or persuade you to give up. The Bible says that God will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Put your trust in God when it comes to your financial situation. God is the provider. His name even means provider. There was the one name he identified himself with, with Abraham, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. So this is a time to pray and ask God, say, God, I don't know what's going to happen with my financial situation. I don't know how I'm going to keep my car, my house, all the things we all go through, but trust God and watch him work. I can tell you many testimonies. I too am a self-employed person and I have to trust God on a day-to-day -day basis to provide clients and to get income from those things. So I have to trust God and I'm just encouraging you, don't be afraid. Fear is always the first thing that you think about. How am I gonna do this? But you don't know how, but God does. So trust him and he'll bring you through. Hello, this is Pastor Marquise and I wanted to encourage you with a scripture today, Psalms chapter 20, verse seven says, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will remember the name of our Lord. Now, when I hear this scripture, what it reminds me of is many people have different things that they are trusting in. They might trust in their finances. They, must, they might trust in their family. They might trust in their friends, but we must remember or trust in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, especially in times like this. One of my, another one of my favorite scriptures is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. That's a promise that we have when we put our trust and faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He will lead us. He will direct us. The Bible also says he will not leave us 
nor forsake us. So right now, as you will have this extra time where you're at the house or you're staying alone, whatever you're doing, I want you to know that God has not lost. God is not lost and God is with you and he's guiding you through this time. And get one of my things that I always say is we have to learn something through whatever we go through. There is something to be taught in this lesson. So my prayer for all of us is God teach us so that we know exactly what we should learn during this time. So don't trust in horses. Don't trust in chariots. Don't trust in your family. Don't trust in finances. Trust in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Well, welcome again to uh, New Creation Christian Center couple announcements I have. First of all, I want to say uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor not to just be a father of children, but a, a father that raises children. And I want to commend all the dads that are raising, hanging in there with their kids, going through the hard times, the good times, the bad times, and all the things that you go through as a father. And and just rejoice that God has blessed you. The Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord. And so we have to rejoice and be glad about what God has given us as fathers. So let's, let's rejoice and we thank you, fathers, for doing all that God has called you to do. It's not easy always, but it's necessary. Amen? And also, I wanted to make this announcement because this is a going to be a slight change. So starting next week, we are going to go back to doing in-person services. So on June 27th and 28th, we're going to start having service on Saturday nights again at 7, and then on Sunday mornings at 11. There are going to be some changes. Everybody in the congregation is going to have to wear masks, and then we have to do temperature scans and all those kinds of things and space people out as best we can. So but we are going to be back in the building, so we rejoice in that fact. So, and we're, we're going to keep doing the live stream. So for those that can't make it or still don't feel comfortable coming out, we will still be able to do that. Amen? So given those two announcements, let's pray, and then we will get back into walking in the Spirit. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, and we just ask that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying as we go through this message to, to this morning. Bless your people. Help us to be doers of your word and not just hearers only. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, amen. Now, last week, we, were, we, we started talking about walking in the spirit, and there's a part of the passage that I left out that I did not read, and uh, I want to read that, and we're going to use it a little bit today. So uh, let's go back to if Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, and just read this part. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear there his own load. And let him who has, is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not faint, lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so the part I wanted to look at is if we sow to our flesh, we will reap of the flesh corruption, but if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap everlasting life. And that is a continuation of the idea that we need to walk in the Spirit so that we won't reap the lusts or we won't fulfill the lust of our flesh. Now, the thing about last week, we went through the works of the flesh and we went through the 
fruit of the Spirit, and that was a comparison so that we can see the differences between the two. So tonight, this morning, we want to look at how do we walk in the Spirit. So now many times we think of things in, in uh, people always want to know how can you do what the Bible says you can do and what are we supposed to do in order to see it come to pass. I know uh, when we were, when as an athlete, there's always little things that you try to change to improve your game a, a, li a little bit more. That's why they do film study. They're always looking for something that gives them another edge that helps them to play even better. If you watch enough sports, and it doesn't matter what kind of a sport it is, every player has a habit of doing something. And when you watch film on that player, you pick up on their habit, or they usually refer to them as tendencies. And using their tendencies, you can predict what they're going to do. Well, the same thing is about the mechanics of walking in the spirit. We want to know how we need to walk, but ultimately, in order to walk in the spirit, it takes the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to constantly remind us and keep us in the vein of walking in the spirit. So the first thing about walking in the spirit then is we have to learn to follow the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this, and let's go to John 14, 15, and 16. And we're going to stay in John for a minute and then to jump over to 1 John. So John 14, 15 says this, If you love me, keep my commandments. This is Jesus speaking. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that may, he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So here Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit is not only going to be leading us, but he's going to be indwelling us. And so it is his power. It's his uh, direction. It's his uh, revelation to us that enables us to walk in the Spirit. So we have to first understand that in order to walk in the Spirit, we need to be led by the Spirit. So let's go to uh, John 15, 26 through 27, which of course is the next chapter over. And this says here, but the helper, the same helper Jesus is sending, comes whom I will shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who perceives from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also and, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit is coming to live in us, direct us, and to testify, or another way of saying, tell us about Jesus. And then you jump over to chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. We won't read all those, but we want to read some of them. It says this, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of, of you ask me, where are you going? And it says, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, the helper, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness, of judgment, and then jump down uh, to verse 13. It says, however, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me and will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So here he says the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. So walking in the Spirit is being led and guided into the truth. And let's go to one other passage, uh, 1 John 2, 26 through 27. Let's 
Of course, 1 John is written by the same person that wrote the Gospel of John, as most of you know. And it says this, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing, now the anointing refers to the Holy Spirit, which you have received from him abides in you. Just like Jesus said, the Spirit is, or the helper is going to come and abide in you. You do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as he, he, it has taught you, you will abide in him. So here, and a lot of people read this and say, oh, that means I don't need a pastor. Well, if you go to Ephesians 4, and this is how, this is how we learn to rightfully divide the word. The Bible says that God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the edification of the body of Christ, which means they are called to teach. So it's the spirit that uses these teachers, these leaders, in order to instruct. But he also reveals things that even sometimes teachers don't always get or understand or reveal. So in addition to being taught the word, the Holy Spirit is also the main teacher. That's why it's so important, you know, division in the church would not exist if we allowed the Holy Spirit to be our instructor. We would put away false doctrine as the Spirit would tell us what things that we need to take in and the things that we need to take out. So the first thing is we have to follow the Holy Spirit. The second thing is we have to learn the scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal them to us. He is the teacher and he teaches us. And as he reveals or shows us, he also teaches us how to use the scripture in order to walk in the spirit. So let's go to a, the uh, the passage in Matthew that where Jesus is tempted by the devil. And all of us have seen this passage and looked at it and, and read it many, many times. But let's just look at this carefully. It says now, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, Matthew. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. So this is the, the uh, temptation. So he's asking Jesus, who was led by the Spirit, the Bible says, if you go back to verse 1, it says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit, you see that in verse 1, into the wilderness to be tempted. So he's led by the Spirit, so Jesus is being led by the Spirit, and the devil right away wants to challenge that leading of the Spirit. So he says, command these stones to be made bread. And he says, uh, Jesus, being led by the Spirit, says, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, of course, this is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit leading him, tells him, shows him what he needs to say to the enemy who is trying to get him to be led by his flesh or him. His, 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 another spirit. Then the devil said, took him high up into the sit, holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you da your dash your foot against a stone. And we know Jesus answers in response to this, It, was, it is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God, which is Deuteronomy 6, 16. And again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve, which is Deuteronomy 10, 20. So Jesus takes the word and he, with being led by the spirit, shows how to walk in the spirit in the face of temptation. Now we all know Jesus is hungry. We all know Jesus came to 
give his life and also become the king of the earth. And, but also Satan wanted to derail his plans by try, trying to get him to jump off the, the roof of the building. So the devil's plan was to sidetrack Jesus. But Jesus' plan or will or God's will for the, Jesus was to walk in, according to his spirit. So you see, the fight is to get you just to compromise just a little bit. You know, we all, we all hear people, well, God understands. You know, God knows that I'm a human being. And of course, God understands and he knows you're a human being. He also knows that we're going to fail. But failing is not a, an excuse for not doing something right. Failing is the process of our fallen nature, but it's not an excuse to stay fallen. Amen. We know we're all going to make mistakes, but that's just like going to take a test and saying, well, I'm not going to take the test because I'm not going to ever get 100% right. That's the wrong attitude. You cannot <clears throat> learn if your whole job, goal is to get 100%. But guess what? 90 to 100 percent is an A. Amen. You can get an A by getting 90 percent. You don't have to get 100 percent. So you have to give and you have to do the best that you can with what God has given you to do. And you have to be led by his spirit. <clears throat> so in this example of Jesus being tempted, we can see how in the process of being tempted, Jesus is successful in stayed in the spirit so that the lust of his flesh don't take over his life which is what Galatians says walk in the spirit so that you won't fulfill the lusts of your flesh amen and so we also see in the next point is walking in the spirit includes learning to think like God thinks which requires us to renew our minds. And we all know uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, so let's go to that. It's one of my often quoted passages. Uh, most of us should probably have memorized this, and it says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God and verse 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me every, to everyone who is among you, not to think more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So not only does he tell us to renew our minds, the first step in the renewing of our minds is not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but to think soberly. Soberly means to think clearly. Don't, don't have this uh, puffed up vi vision of yourself and therefore you can get your mind right once you understand that you're just a human being created in the image of God that God wants to use but he doesn't, he doesn't put you up higher than anybody else. The Bible says that God is not a respecter of people, his persons. He doesn't, he's not impressed by who you think you are but he can make you greater than you've ever thought you could be. Amen? So we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. And I'm going to, go, I'm going to spend a few t minutes on, on, on these scriptures that talk about the renewing of the mind. Because, see, walking in the Spirit first takes the understanding of what the Spirit is. We need to know what the Spirit is in order to walk in the Spirit. So it says in 20, verse 23, Ephesians chapter 4, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So renewing your mind is putting on righteousness, not just in your character, not just in the things you do, but it's in the things you think. The Bible says, as a man thinks so in his heart, so is he. And Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and he also says, out of the heart comes all sorts of evil things. So if we, as we, we think of the mind as a, the controller 
of the things that we think. It cleans out the garbage in our life and then causes us to do those things that God wants us to do in the spirit. So we have to get our minds changed. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 10, verse 4 through 6. And then we're going to go to some Old Testament passages. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 6 says this, and most of us even know this passage. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or natural, but mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and the old King James says imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, the weapons, well, what's the weapon? The weapon is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the one that causes our mind to be renewed. It causes us to think the way God wants us to think. It causes us to put aside the things that are not like God. Part of the problem in the church, or even for those, well, outside the church, it's a different standard. They don't really even know what God thinks or what God wants. But part of the problem in the church is that we do not take on the thought life of God. And you might say, oh, pastor, that's a, that's a lofty statement. Well, let's go to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 55. He says it, not me. And most of us know this passage, I know, if you've read the Bible at all. It says, 55, verse 7 and nine, through 9, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. <laughs> it says, And let him return to the Lord, Lord, and he will have mercy on him and, our, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So that's what he tells the wicked. And then he says this, for my thoughts, oh, lost my spot here, sorry. The Lord who oh, took turn, <laughs> it turned the page on me, sorry about that. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we don't have God's thoughts as unrighteous people, but then he tells us to renew our minds so that we can learn to think like he thinks. Now, you might say, well, how is it possible to think like God thinks? Because God knows everything. Well, we don't, we don't obtain the ability to know everything, so let's clarify that. But to think like God thinks means to understand what the word of God has revealed to us, that we fill our minds with that truth, and that truth is the thing that governs the things that we do in our lives. And because the Holy Spirit is the teacher of truth, he teaches us how to discern and how to rightly divide and how to use the word of God so that we can have a mind that is consistent with what God would have us have think about. And this is a process that takes, of course, a lifetime, but many Christians don't take their walk with God that far. We always talk about going to heaven, but God doesn't just want you to go to heaven. He wants you to renew your mind so that when you're on earth, you think, not only you think right, but you act right. So you can't act right if you don't know what is right. And many Christians are, not, are confused about what is right and what is wrong. Uh, the scripture tells us what's right and what is wrong. And it's not confusing at all. There are some things that the Bible doesn't speci specifically speak towards, but there's a very few of those things that we don't, may not understand, but the Bible is clear about the major things. 
And so we have to learn to allow the Spirit of God to renew our minds so that we can think the way God wants us to think. Maybe that's a better way. Most people get scared when you say, I want to think the thoughts of God. Who's Oh, I don't want to do that because I, I can't do that. Well, he wants you to think the right way. Let's go to a couple last passages and then we'll close and we'll pick up this, the rest of this next week. Let's go to a Psalms chapter 10, verse 3, I believe it is. Verse 4, excuse me. Psalms 10, verse 4 says, The wicked in his proud continent, the continents does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. So notice he says the wicked. So the question is, as a believer, is God in your thoughts? Are you thinking about the things of God in your life? And then the last passage, and then we'll close. Proverbs Chapter 16, verse 3. It says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. So this is one passage that tells you how to renew your mind. You commit your works or your ways to God and he will establish your thoughts. Isn't that amazing? So it's about surrendering. If you surrender what you have to God, he will teach you how to think right according to his will and his plan for your life. Amen? All right, well, we'll stop here today, and we'll just pick up with this next week. So remember, we want to walk in the Spirit. We want to allow the Spirit of God to lead us. We want to stop being ahead. and We want to follow. Then we want the Spirit of God to teach us the Word of God and to teach us how to use the Word of God. And then thirdly, we want to renew our mind so that we think the way that God wants us to think. And as a result of thinking the way God wants us to think, we act and live the way God wants us to act and live. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, and then we're going to close for the day. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this is what it's like to walk in the Spirit. And Lord, no, we're not perfect. We're never going to do this perfectly. But Lord God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would carry us and lead us and guide us and direct us so that we can learn to do this and be more and more successful each and every day. And Father, I lift up those that have been sick. Lord, I lift up my sister Cynthia, who's been had a surgical procedure. I pray for you to touch her body. Heal her, Lord God, where she is. Pray for Angela, who had a stroke in the hospital. Lord, I command her body, her blood pressure to come down. I command the, any uh, residual effects from the stroke be healed. I command all the motions of her vital organs, her muscles, her tissue, her arms, her legs, her thinking, her speech, return fully and completely and that she be completely healed in the name of Jesus. And we lift up Hannah's friend's mother and we pray for you to heal her body, Lord. Touch her, Lord God, and heal her and raise her up. And Lord God, anybody else that might be sick, I pray that you would send your word. Your word says that you sent your word and you healed them of all their diseases. So, Lord, wherever people hear this message and wherever they may need a healing touch in their body, I pray that you would heal their bodies. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We thank you. We give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us know if God has touched your body so that we could rejoice with you. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. We thank you for listening to today's sermon, and we pray that you are impacted to become the new creation that God desires. We at New Creation Christian Center invite you to come join us for service Saturday at 7 p.m. or Sunday at 11 a.m. located at 5150 South Cloverdale Street, Seattle, Washington. Also, feel free to visit us 
online at newcreationwa.org. New Creation Christian Center, the path to genuine life, where you can come as you are and be transformed by the Word of God.